I had a dream and I saw the most horrible type of human future that a person could imagine. The dream set. So first of all, I woke up right at the crack of dawn. It was around 3.15 here, almost 3.30. And I went back to sleep and this is the set of dreams I had. I saw this group comes and I'm pretty certain that they were angels. But this group, they come and they take this man. He's a, a dark brown man, not, not, Af not continental African, but... Uh, maybe Hispanic, maybe South American, could be an American of any type. And they transport him several times through time to show him what the future of humanity is going to be like. In the first scene, he arrives on top of this hill and he looks around. And the hill is completely made of mud. The only thing that exists on the hill is a kind of a, a Roman structure, but it's clearly been out of use for a very long time, and it's completely stripped of anything. It, all, all that remains are a foundation, a few columns that look of the Roman type, you know, with these kind of vertical ribs on them, and then a, a very plain, looks like a concrete slab as a roof. And it, that whole thing is white, and it's completely abandoned. He looks and he sees like a kind of a finger jutting out, and he looks and in the distance and he sees uh, walking toward him a line of people. So he wants to observe them, so he gets on his stomach and he low crawls out onto this jut so that he can see them. And as they get closer, he can plainly see that it's some kind of a, a what looks like a work crew. They have very old clothing, the sleeves are torn off, there are holes in them, they look threadbare, uh, but they do cover the people. There are men and women, all adults of every race, whites, blacks, uh, every shade of brown, Asians, and he just watches them approach, and after a while, no one's guiding them. They all walk in a, a single, not lockstep, but they're all in one line. They, they appear tired. A few of them have their heads down. No one talks. No one makes any speech at all. So he, he's watching this, and suddenly he realizes, wow, you know, where I've crawled out to, I'm kind of exposed to view. Somebody may see me. But right then, this, is, this moment is kind of too late for him. And somehow he has been seen, and then the dream kind of shows this perspective. There's like this, in the dream it seemed like a higher thought. But it was also this higher thought seemed to have its own sentience. And it gets word that this guy is there. It knows he's there. And this sentience signals this group of, of workers to immediately go and grab him. So there's nobody, it's not like one person in the group receives a radio signal or anything. He receives this information instantly, as does everyone else. Nobody points and says, there he is, and then they run for him. They instantly know his location, and they run for him. And he stands up, and he says, ooh, I gotta get out of here. So he runs away from them. But when he gets to the other side of the hill, he looks, and there are two different lines coming from different vectors, headed straight at him. And in one of these lines, there, there's like a leader. And this guy, he breaks away out of the line. All the other lines, they all stay in a line. Even if they're moving in an infinite direction or straight ahead, they all maintain this kind of linear formation, which is really strange. Again, nobody says anything. All the other groups look basically the same as far as a mix of, of genders and races. So one of these guys, he's, he's different, and he runs toward him. He's got a spear, he's larger, he's much more muscular. And as I see him, because of this connection with this higher thought, I understand that this guy is what, in our time, we would call a collaborator. But in their time, he is called like a something, a, a word that means something like a handler or a herder maybe like a minder, right? Something like this. And that's who he is. And this guy seems to maybe have a different perspective. He's not totally bound by the same thought control that all the others are. And he runs out of the line. And he's the only one in this whole scene that behaves any differently than everyone else in his group. So, and he, but he had some kind of a different relationship. He was like, he was like a sellout. Like he... He was willing, he preferred the aliens or something somehow. And as I'm kind of seeing all this information, I see a picture that represents this higher mind. It turns out it's not totally a hive mind, like a collective mind, but it is more like a controlled mind. So that there's, like in a computer system, you have one computer that sets the time 
for all other computers so that uh, information packets can be coordinated and whatever else. And that computer is called the master and all the others are called the slave. So in this kind of a system, this hive mind system, this entity that I see, he's the master and all the others are the slaves. And this guy looks basically somewhat like, if you ever saw the Land of the Lost, the Slee Stack, uh, the Lizard Men characters. And this thing had a, a flat nose with widely offset nostrils, uh, a jaw that jutted out about, if you look at a, a modern lizard, like the small animal, the, the reptile that crawls on the ground, about a fourth of the you know ratio that that thing's jaw juts out from in front of its eyes. So he had like a big snout there, and his head was kind of uh, tapered toward the top, and he was covered in green scales. And I only saw his face, his mouth, his jaw, uh, part of his lower neck, and then out toward his shoulders, kind of like the old Roman bust might show. And I saw him, and this guy, again, he didn't move his mouth or anything, but he was the one communicating, and he's communicating to them this simple will. Get him. Get that guy. And this guy, when they see him, they realize that he is not in the hive mind, that he's not integrated. And there's a word they call him, which means something like a rebel, but they have a term for him. And to them, it's a very bad term. Even though they're humans, they see the, the free human as an enemy and they all run to And they're faster than this guy. He's a healthy, not overweight in any way, young, youngish looking guy, maybe 27, 30 could be, maybe 35, I don't know. But this guy, he starts running, and he looks at the angles. These other three groups are approaching him, and he chooses another angle, and then he sees others coming from even more distant places, and he's like, there is nowhere to run. Everywhere he looks, the, there's a lot of mud everywhere. There's some green off in the distance, but where he is, it's all mud, and he, the most open place he realizes is just deep mud, and he realizes he can't run through that, so he, he picks one direction, and he runs off in that direction, and... Uh, Right then, he gets transported out. So before they catch him, he gets transported out, and then he goes to a new scene. And at this new scene, there's this huge kind of a metal building. I mean, it's very large. I don't think I've ever seen a metal building so large in my lifetime. But people are going in and out through these doors, so he goes in. And inside, he sees this very large bazaar. It's a, it's a marketplace. And it seems like all the little booths and stalls are somewhat, you know, however you want, kind of built. You know, they're built of this or that. Some are open, some aren't. And um, he walks through this bazaar. It's very busy. There are a lot of people in there, people selling all types of things. And he sees a place that's selling some clothes. And as he walks up to it, there's a black man who walks up and he says, hey, do you, what can you tell me about these hooded sweatshirts? And the time traveler, he looks at the black guy and even though he doesn't work there, he says, he says, well, what do you like about this shirt? You know, Let's look at it. And so they start looking at it. It has a hood on it, and it has this big kind of a pouch that closes on the front of it, which is kind of unusual. And then uh, a Filipino man walks up, and he introduces himself. He's the owner, and he wants to offer his assistance. So the, the time traveler, he says, you know, what are these two holes for? So kind of between the seam on the shoulder and where the hood is attached, uh, you know, in line with the top seam, there are these two holes, and, you know, it's not... They're designed there, like they're, they're threaded all the way around, right? And he says, what are these holes for? Are these either to, you know, let the steam from sweat come out or are they to let rain come in? And he kind of laughs and the other people just smile. The other two men smile at him. And so then the Filipino takes over and helps this black man choose the clothes that he wants. So a few minutes later, the black man has left. Somebody comes up and says, hey, the, the black man wants to take a photo with you. Now, in the dream, they're not calling him the black man. He has a name, but I just don't remember it, so I'm just making this reference. So uh, the time traveler says, oh, really? I, I, I would be happy to take a photo with him. And the person says, oh, no, not with you, with, with him. And he points to the Filipino owner. And the, the, Filip the, the, the time traveler is kind of surprised because he had made this special effort to be friendly to the black man. Even though he didn't work there, he thought, well, this guy asked me, so I'm going to help him out. Uh, and so, but in the end, the black man likes the Filipino guy better. He prefers his company. Why? Maybe, you know, just pure speculation. You know, the Filipino man was generally, genuinely interested. But the time traveler from his time, he more wanted to help the black man because of, uh, there was a sense of he... 
just a little bit of a sense of he liked how it looked that he would be more friendly to this guy and he didn't want to say to him well I don't work here because it might be perceived as you know a a racial discourtesy right so that's why he had helped him so it was more out of obligation almost you know some kind of a cultural obligation with you know just a dash of fear of consequences you know sprinkled into the recipe so that's why he had done it but the Filipino guy was truly friendly to him I, this black guy said yeah come take a picture with me and so this guy was kind of he was hurt a little bit by that and it surprised him like he didn't understand how it went that way but at this time he looks and he notices that in the booth next to him there's a big white woman she's got this big curly hair she might be fit in her 50s somewhere she's very heavy and she takes a careful step up onto her little shop that is you know one step above this other guy's and right then the ground begins to shake and the building shakes and you can hear the steel building rattling Krrr, you know if you've ever been in one that's shaking it makes a very distinct sound if it's been pushed by the wind or a scud missile explosion or whatever it is you know it it shakes and it makes a very unique sound and someone yells earthquake and then people start screaming running yelling now the time traveler he kind of sticks to his place and the scene kind of quickly advances through time and what it's what you see is that the market resumes and then later there's another small earthquake and then it resumes again and there's another small earthquake and then there are a series of earthquakes and then the man quickly moves forward and he comes to a time and he and time stops again and well it goes back to regular speed I suppose you'd say and he looks around the market and the entire huge building are completely empty and he's standing in front of the Filipinos little space his stall where he used to have his wares and there is now a sign on there that says, you know, this by order of the government, you know, this uh, business is closed. And there's like a red tape across it and has some kind of a seal stamped on there. And this thing is officially closed. Like it cannot be opened. And it's and they, they credit the, the danger from earthquakes. That's why this shop is now closed. So now that scene ends and the time traveler, he moves again. And he moves again to a place that looks like it might have been the first place but at a much earlier time. So he arrives there, and again, there are these uh, dilapidated buildings. They haven't been used in some time, but they still look serviceable, like you could move in there and you'd be protected from wind and weather and rain, uh, but no one's using those houses. And also in this little environment, there is these kind of barricades over anything that looks like it might be a, a, not the main avenue. So a side door, a side alley, um, a space between buildings, they're all blocked off. So it makes this community look like almost like a prison, a prisoner community. Like the people who were there uh, weren't permitted to freely travel wherever they wanted. But that is not this time. That time was sometime well before this scene. And these people, and so a, a group arrives and they don't notice the time traveler. So maybe he's invisible to them or something. Uh, that's pretty much how it seems. Like he's just watching this scene and rather than interacting in it as the very first one. So one guy comes up and he seems to be the, the leader a little bit. Maybe he has the most social charisma. But he grabs uh, one of these metal barriers and he pulls on it with his weight. And then the other people start step. This creates a little bit of a gap. And the other people start stepping through. And as they're stepping through, uh, this black man, he comments, he says, who would have known that this is what it would take to end racism? And, and this blonde woman who's stepping through, right as he says that, she says, really? And they all kind of start laughing together and just enjoying a, a moment with themselves. So as they go through this crack, they all start walking into what is kind of hidden by some bushes and hidden by... The buildings on this main kind of avenue of this small town where they are a makeshift kind of a shelter and it's all made from basically looks like plywood it could be a really large chicken coop so there's like individual spaces and this is where the people live but there are no personal belongings there there's no running water there's no electricity no pictures no mattresses nothing and it seems like maybe these people only use this place at night and during the day they hide elsewhere that was that scene. And as they're walking in, somehow this kind of a backstory goes through the mind of the traveler who's witnessing the scene. And what he sees is that some powerful race of alien beings, right, a different race of creature, came to the earth and started a huge war. And at this point where they live, these people are are considered rebels. So in the first dream, you know, they had this term for the guy 
who wasn't in, integrated into the hive mind. And now in this scene, this is these people are not integrated, and they are this kind of a thing, this rebel. Except they're not fighting them. They're rebelling against joining by not joining, by remaining free, by avoiding capture, by avoiding ens enslavement, mind enslavement, labor enslavement. And so, and I also understand that there are other people, and I see these people, and they move sometimes to different towns, they try to hide under trees a lot, they like to stay in forested areas, and that's basically who they are. These people are a rebel group. And now the scene moves again, and what, what it shows is there's just like an open ground, there's maybe a little bit of green growing here, but there's a lot of like rich brown soil there, and this woman, she is on her knees. It's the blonde woman. It looks very much like it's the same blonde woman who was going through this barrier being held open by the, by the bald-headed black guy. And she is weeping and moaning horribly like you, even someone's loved one is killed. You don't rarely see somebody in such horrible, because it's mixed with terror. And she's weeping there and crying and she's holding, her left arm is on her right forearm and she's looking at her right hand. And as she's watching it, the hand begins to turn this blue color and very quickly these blue scales form. Now these scales are very much in the same size and proportion and appearance as the scales on the lizard man that was shown in the first scene, the master of the hive mind. Except these are clearly blue, like a very blue color of blue, not even a little green or something, but blue. And then her arm begins to extend. Now she's just watching this, she is not controlling it. It's doing this on its own. So she's been captured and here, and it's, and it's, here in this scene that I first hear the term that they use, which is uh, transformed. Like, she has been transformed. They captured her, and now she's regained her consciousness sometime later, and she's watching her hand, and the hand itself stretches out. And without exaggeration, it reaches about 10 yards away and grabs something else and then comes back to her. And she is just horrified by all of this. She's uh, miserable. And the other thing that I see in her thoughts is that she would prefer to die, but she can't. Like, she knows that she could not die. She couldn't kill herself if she tried. So, and this is something people, other people have talked about uh, in the book of Revelation that says, you know, they desire death and they cannot die. So she could not die, but she, what had happened to her made her want to die, but she couldn't. So then what happens next is, she stops screaming and her whole head transforms. The back of her skull remains like a, a human appearance. It has like her blonde hair there, her long blonde hair, uh, collar length blonde hair. And But her face transforms. It stretches out. It turns blue. The blue scales appear, but also this very large beak. And it looks like she has a face basically like an eagle. And she's her face is transformed. So she's mostly a humanoid, but she has this blue hand that stretches uh, like Elastic Man, and she has this face like an eagle. So, and for her, it's this really horrible experience. Like, it is just devastating for her to realize that, you know, she had tried so hard and worked so long to avoid capture. This was the worst thing in her imagination that could ever happen to her. So, in the next scene, uh, they show another woman, and this woman has a different transformation. And when her hand stretches out, it turns into something that looks like a kind of a yellowish uh, Caucasian skin color, something that looks like a cross between a starfish and a frog. And on this starfish, it has a big mouth that looks kind of like an artichoke, like if you strip away all the vertical leaves off an artichoke and you just have the flower at the bottom, the mouth looks kind of like that. And this mouth extends out like a, like a sturgeon fish and tastes the dirt. Like, that's what it does. It tastes the dirt. And this little frog starfish thing, it sends back a mineral analysis of the dirt to the hive mind. So this, this particular transformation has a purpose to the hive mind. Like, it has a function so that it can serve them better. Like, that's the purpose of the transformation. It's not a torture. It's to make them, it's to make better slaves, make better workers. And it's, and it's here that I understand a little more in this scene that this hive mind fully controls them. The, the blue stretchy hand, that was controlled by the hive mind. It did what the hive mind wanted. The person did what the hive mind wanted. But she was still in there. Like, she was, her sentience or whatever 
was still along for the ride. Now what happens is the scene kind of shows, it goes forward and it shows that this woman, eventually she accepts her fate. Like she becomes the person with the, the blue face and the hand that stretches and does different things. Like she becomes that person, she accepts it and she lives that life. Now the scene changes one more time and it shows one more transformed person. He looks the same as, as a normal man would. And he's sitting somewhere, he's sitting in the dirt, so he's relaxing, and there's near him, there's a, a black-skinned man, and he's squatting on his haunches, and the black man asks him, he says, so you, you never knew you were gay until after you were transformed? And the Australian man says, no, no, I really never knew it. And here you kind of see this, the backstory of the Australian man. Same as it happened with this other group in the, you know, abandoned town, the, there's a backstory shown for this Australian man. He also had been spending a lot of time in thick jungles. He had spent some time in makeshift villages, uh, abandoned towns as well. He had lived like this. And in all of those situations, he was with groups of other people. Again, all adults, uh, mixed races, uh, men and women both. And in all of those, he always preferred women. He was always interested in women. Never once had it occurred to him that he might be gay. Never once had he looked at another man and been interested. But now, he says, tells this other guy, he said, yeah, you know, I really had no idea, but now I understand this is who I am. I fully embrace it. So for whatever reason, some reason I don't, you know, I don't understand, except if you consider something like Aliester Crowley's kind of sex magic, the things that they did to open portals for demons, there might be a, pers a purpose for this. So the guy says, yeah, now I know that I'm gay, and I'm, he's, and this Australian man, he believes that he was always gay, and he just didn't know it. Like, he doesn't question this in any way. His complete mind, his desires, everything has been rewritten. That was part of his transformation. Maybe all of it, because it doesn't show anything else. And that is the end of the dreams. And so, it's clear in these dreams that there is this component of race. Like, the race hatred amongst mankind is a big problem. Like, we, if, if everybody would just receive Jesus, have the peace of Jesus, have this oneness with God, we would all see each other, well, at least closer to the way that God sees us, as His children, as people worthy of love. And we wouldn't have these fears and this hatred, and we wouldn't have wars, because what I see in all my collections of dreams, and I've had other dreams that are somewhat similar to these, I'm not going to discuss them now, but this isn't a one-off, this isn't the only time I've ever seen a future where humans are transformed into something else. And I'm going to add a clip at the end of this video showing you uh, a film from 1986, Jeff Goldblum, The Fly, and some of the things they say. It hints toward this. You know, we now understand there's so much predictive programming. Well, in television we see transformation. There are recent serials in which aliens control the world and they cause people to be transformed. By the way, my first transformation, human transformation dream, uh, was before I ever saw any type of a show. Well, not before The Fly, but it hadn't. But The Fly is based on a science uh, storyline and not on an alien invasion storyline, so not the same. So these are warnings from God. I've I've prayed about, it. and you know we really need to transform our hearts. Or this is not the absolute future. We can have a different future if we will learn to behave. There have been a few times where angels talk to me in dreams. And they say, you know, 500 years from now, 500 years from now. And I'm always wondering why they talk about 500 years from now. And I think that we are in the opening phases of what is going to become 500 hellish years for humanity on this earth. And I think that at some point, 500 years from now, people regain their freedom and they are again set free. We want to avoid that. We don't want another dark ages in the history of man. So we need to repent of our sin. We need to draw near to God. And we need to teach others to do the same. We need to evangelize. We need to transform hearts and minds of the people in this world. Our neighbors, our family members. And it starts with fervent, consistent, regular, heartfelt prayer. Do not be ashamed to weep and moan for your lost neighbors for your relatives that reject Jesus, for your friends who say they're Christians and do whatever they want in this world. Because it's the sin that is opening the door for the enemy to gain a foothold. This is the man from Modesto reminding you, as always, to pray.
or be defeated. Sorry, I have three other interviews to do before this party's over. Yep, yeah, they're not working on something that'll change the world as we know it. They say they are. Yeah, but they're lying. Molecular decimation, breakdown, and reformation is inherently purging. Those weird hairs that were growing out of your back, I had them analyzed. But they were definitely not human. No! You're afraid to be destroyed and recreated, aren't you? You're changing, Seth. Everything about you is changing. Oh, no. What's happening to me? Am I dying? What's to turn me into something else? I'm afraid! Don't be afraid! No. Be afraid. Be very afraid. <laughs> Help me, please, help me.